So Kerry, this dimension is business smarts. And as we mentioned earlier, one of these capabilities in particular kept coming up throughout all the focus groups and the research uh, that we did leading up to this capability framework. But to recap, the three capabilities are courageous consulting, marketing and communication, and finance and budgeting. And yes, I know for some people it may raise our eyebrows saying, what has this got to do with me as a learning professional? But I think we've really got to start with that one that just kept popping up when people are saying, I really want to see it at the table. And it was really around this courageous consulting. Do you mind giving us a bit more overview on what that capability is about, courageous consulting? Sure, absolutely. And, and you're right, it virtually came up in every single focus group or discussion that we had. So we just had to include it into our capability framework. So it's being able to provide your frank and honest feedback to your stakeholders, just to make sure that you do get the right solution, not wanting to just please and do what they, they think. Because sometimes they may have decided what the wrong solution was. Um, they might sort of think, you know, time management tick that will do that, where it could be something to do with performance management. Um, or, you know, in their wisdom and, and needs, they might sort of decide that they have to shorten the time frame of the program or cut the budget. So having that honest and frank conversation about, well, you know, if that, if we do that, then these are the consequences, you know, or working with them to come up with a better solution, um, you know, is one thing. And, you know, it really takes initiative to, to work through some of those challenging issues that you come across with um, your stakeholders and being able to offer your professional opinion to achieve the successful outcomes that you need to. Quite interesting too that, you know, you've used a few words there about being frank and honest and showing initiative. What we were seeing in, in the focus groups was almost an apprehension because there seemed to be a balance of power that goes to the client, whether they be internal or, or external, where they're actually looking to us as the professional with the experience to guide them. And sometimes they need to hear what they don't want to hear. But is that what we're talking about here about having enough trust that you can have those honest conversations and guide them to what they really need? Absolutely. We should be partnering with our stakeholders just to make sure that we do get the right outcomes. It's not so much we want to please them because we know um, if we do go along and please, because that's what they want and you want to you know, make them keep them happy, you know, if you then deliver the wrong solution and it doesn't, you know, solve the learning need that was identified, you know, you're virtually not going to get called back. So, you know, it's having that conversation and working with them, you know, through, you know, what they've identified, what they're seeing, what they would like to see, and then sort of, um, you know, just determining which would be the right process. So, you know, it is that confidence to, to speak up and think about your long term, because if you get it wrong, um, just because you were trying to please, you know, you, you won't be invited back again. But if you've got someone that sort of gets them to step up and make them understand why that solution won't work or why it's important um, that you deliver it within the required time frame, or if they do want to shorten it, then what you might be able to deliver within that time frame will change, or you might have to look at different solutions. So, you know, incorporating more of a blended learning approach, um, you know, as, as opposed to what they're sort of suggesting. And you mentioned they're pleasing. Um, I know from personal experience that trying to please an internal client or even an external one doesn't end up earning credibility. Uh, a, just a quick anecdote. I remember years ago, uh, a multinational client wanting training or development on feedback. And we actually went back to them and said, we don't believe that your, your staff need to be trained on how to give feedback. What we actually think we need to address is why people are not asking for feedback, which links to some of uh, the other dimensions around the impact on culture and a learning organization. They felt really challenged by that, but I'm actually feeling good about what you've just said now, because we did, I suppose, take the courage to give them that challenge and build more credibility by saying, here's what you're not looking at and here's what will get a better net result and better performance across the whole organization. So is that on the right track? Absolutely. It's sort of, you know, it's building that trust so that they know that you will be authentic and honest with them when you need to be. So it's, it's really important. And, you know, another example might be that, you know, they've developed that relationship with you and they've gone, Joshua, you are fantastic in that leadership one. We now want you to drive this change strategy within the organization. And, you know, quite often we don't let the client down. So it's also, you know, being honest and say, hey, that's not my specialty. But through my network, I can highly recommend this person. So you're still 
building up that, you know, that trusted advisor and um, that they can work with um, to, to help with their learning needs. Yeah, to, uh, yeah, again, I know that one firsthand, the amount of times I've said no to a client myself, and then you see that look of shock, but I say, look, I know other professional members that do f- specialise in that area, and because they've got the credibility of being within an organisation like APILP or having credentials, that, that trust actually increases with the referral, so... Mm. Thank you for the dive on that one. It was one that came up consistently and we heard a lot about I, how do I get a seat at the table? That one was key. There's another part that, that goes with this and it is the next capability, which is really around marketing and, and communication. Kerry, I'd, I'd like to ask you to expand on that one because some learning professionals say, well, I'm not a marketer or I'm not in communication, but it seems that we are actually in a form of marketing and we are communication experts when it comes to learning. Is that right? Absolutely. And it's sort of thinking, you know, outside of the, you know, that, you know, it's just all about design and delivery, but it's sort of, you know, it can't sit alone anymore. So it's sort of having a look at, you know, how do we present and convey information to our stakeholders so make it clear, interesting, you know, and in a manner that's going to be appropriate for your target audience. So, you know, we've got to customise it. As we do our learning, we've got to customise our communication um, methods and um the, you know, the terms that we use and then, you know, constantly monitoring the stakeholders needs and provide clearly defining marketing solutions. So what works in one organisation may not work in another organisation. They might have their own internal way of communicating about programs. So we need to know how we can fit in with that. Can we add value to that? Um, you know, and it might, you know, and, and it's thinking about your opportunities like collecting testimonials or case studies and using that for promotional methods as well. So, yeah, there's a, there's a whole range, but it's, 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 it's thinking outside the box. So it seems like we're in a, a day and age and particularly going into the future where marketing shouldn't be crossed up with selling. This is making people aware of what's available and contributing to tactical campaigns that enable the organization and the individual learners to know what's coming up or what somebody else has done and how they could benefit from that. Absolutely. It's capturing those, you know, the value, the benefits, the examples. So, you know, we can't just make sure that, you know, they'll see the, the content in a program or instantly, you know, identify, well, that's going to help me this way. But, you know, if we put it into relevant terms of how but somebody else has applied it or, you know, for them, how it's going to help them in their role, it's such a much more powerful message to get them, you know, excited and engaged in the learning process. So the, um, the one that won't be obvious unless someone's got an accounting or a bookkeeping background is I, I've got to ask, you know, why is finance and budgeting a capability for a learning professional? Um, I, I'm certainly not asking it in a negative way, but clearly the research and, and the work that was done to build this framework showed that it, it was of acute importance. Can you explain to us around what, what role does finance and budgeting play as a capability for a learning professional? Well, I think the first thing I need to say is don't panic. We're not trying to make um, learning professionals into accountants. It's sort of, it, it's, we're talking about basic concepts and things like that. So, you know, it's understanding the cost of our programs and, you know, break even points um, and also, you know, measuring, you know, the cost or the real cost of service or, you know, to develop and deliver the program. So that, you so know, when we are commercial about acumen, is that what we're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's realistic commercial acumen, you know, through our pa- um, planning and budgeting. It's understanding and monitoring the cost benefit of our programs through, you know, the learning investment from the organisation and the outcomes that they're getting. And then also making sure we communicate and monitor that commercial aspect of our training programs to the relevant stakeholders. So it's all starting to make sense now that this dimension is called business smarts for a reason that we are no longer just a professional that can facilitate someone's learning. We actually have to tie in with the business and be attached to the performance of the organisation, the business or the person's career through that courageous consulting, the, you know, being brave enough to have the honest conversations through the marketing and communication. And as you've just pointed out, having finance and budgeting awareness to have that commercial acumen. So to recap, our three capabilities for business smarts are courageous consulting, marketing and communication and finance and budgeting. Definitely looking forward to, uh, to the mentoring sessions on this one because it's taking it in a direction that clearly is moving us forward to be a lot more professional as learning professionals.
Mm, absolutely. So, and it's one of those ones that, you know, as I said, if, if you want to be successful as a learning professional, these are things that are going to sort of, I guess they sort of, you know, support that, um, those other capabilities that you have. So very important. Terry, thank you once again. So for Business Smarts, just to recap, it's Courageous Consulting, Marketing Communications and Finance and Budgeting. And we look forward to the mentor sessions on these capabilities for Business Smarts.